our next speaker is going to be Jack Sharman. Uh, Jack comes to us from the uh, Lightfoot firm in Alabama, uh, which has some uh, fantastic trial lawyers, and uh, Jack is uh, certainly cut from that cloth. Uh, he, uh, he thinks of the uh, place where your life meets the legal system as a cliff, and in order to f uh, avoid falling off the cliff, you need two things, a good story and somebody to tell it. Uh, Jack is going to come, uh, the story I guess he's going to talk to us today about is uh, how to win your civil case uh, by thinking like a uh, criminal defense lawyer. So uh, please uh, welcome Jack Sharman. For everyone except the defendant, criminal cases are more fun than civil cases. There's virtually no discovery. You get to trial quickly. Uh, you often have no affirmative defense, so you don't need to spend time uh, working on one. And they are intensely personal for both the lawyer and the client. The client particularly, of course, who does not wish to go to prison and become the prom date of somebody named Vincent Big Jaws. <laughs> Those same characteristics teach us a lot about civil trials, except maybe for the part about Vincent. Business people, though, tend to ignore these lessons. Business people say, we are not criminals. Our lawyers' suits are not shiny. That is a dangerous thing to say because there are lessons we can take away from criminal trials, and let's spend a few minutes this morning uh, talking about them. General Patton said that a good plan of violently executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. The first lesson from criminal trials useful for people in this room is immediacy and urgency. The, uh, the government in a criminal case is always ahead of you, sometimes, uh, always by months, sometimes by years. Civil cases, on the other hand, lumber along and we tend to get a little reactive you should demand from your lawyers a plan that is fraught with immediacy and proactivity. But what are the characteristics of that plan? There's probably a lot, but there's at least three that we need to keep in mind. First, take the fight to your adversary. Second, make the trial about them, not about us. And then finally, get to the enemy's rear as quickly as we can. So let's take those in turn. First, in a criminal case, you cannot wait until you are attacked. If you wait your turn, you will lose the jury. You will lose the jury because too many people still believe FBI agents and prosecutors. Too many people still believe that if you are charged with the crime, you are guilty of it. You cannot wait your turn in a criminal trial. That lesson is a critical one for civil cases. In addition, civil lawyers will often wait contentedly until they can offer their own polished affirmative case. A white collar lawyer often has no case and he has a client who cannot testify. So if we're going to do anything, we have to do it in our adversary's case. So what are the takeaway points on that? There's pretrial and trial. Pretrial, first, immediately analyze <clears throat> the evidence that is most sensitive. Most sensitive for us and most sensitive for the bad guys. And then don't wait on discovery. Criminal lawyers get almost no discovery. Like them, 
civil defense lawyers should use investigators, paralegals, junior lawyers, four-fee databases in order to build a case. That's the pretrial point. The trial point is to put on your case in their case as much as you can. For example, you can often get in documents that you need to get in through one of their witnesses with relatively little exposure to your own case. Similarly, and contrary to most theatrical and movie portrayals of, of, of criminal trial lawyers, use a cross that is non-destructive. Use a cross that is a series of agrees, agree, 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 to either establish an, an element that you need through their people or to strip out an element that, on which they have the burden. Those of us of a certain age will remember uh, Colonel North and his lawyer, Brendan Sullivan, and Colonel North's testimony before a special committee of Congress about what was then called the Iran-Contra affair. Colonel North and Mr. Sullivan turned the hearing on its head. And the hearing ceased to be about Iran-Contra and became a hearing about the unfairness of the hearing. In a criminal case, because we often either have no documents or if we have them, we would prefer not to share them, the battle has to be taken to them and the story has to be about them. It's not about us. The jury has to look at them, not at, at us. The civil lesson for that is don't become so enamored, uh, uh, enamored of our own witnesses and our own documents and our own experts and our own PowerPoints. Rather, when you get a case analysis or a trial plan from a lawyer, look in there and see how are we going to tell the judge and the jury that these are the bad guys? What are we doing right off the bat to build what I call the alternative narrative? Some prosecutors have given it less kind names. What I call the alternative narrative about why they're the bad guys and we're the good guys. On August 2nd, 216 BC, a general from Carthage in North Africa named Hannibal destroyed the Roman forces at the Battle of Cannae. Hannibal did this by invoking what has been a standard military tactic for almost two millennia, which is getting to the enemy's rear. By doing so, you disrupt his lines of supply and communication, you open up an opportunity to attack him on his flanks, you force his rear guard to suddenly become the vanguard, and you give his offensive forces a choice of either retreating or suddenly playing defense. In criminal cases, the government's case almost always seems impenetrable from the front by which I mean from the indictment as portrayed uh, in, the, in the media um, or as um, uh, explained in opening. But the government, just like your civil adversary, is weak in the back and often on the flanks. And what do I mean by that? Sloppy pleading, briefs that are cut and pasted from other uh, cases, uh, poor handling of electronically stored information, uh, disregard or abuse of the privilege, uh, an inability to comply with basic case management uh, orders, a, a failure to make disclosures that are required by the rules. All those things happen in 
criminal cases. All those things happen in civil cases. All those things are opportunities to help make the story about them and not about us. All right, so practically, how do we put these things into play? What do you need to ask a lawyer about when you're in this situation and you want to take it to them? In the book of Revelation, there are, there are seven seals, so there's going to be seven characteristics here, and we're going to go over them quickly. First, I want you to investigate now, not later. I want you to analyze now, not later. Third, I want you to ask yourself, no matter how much I love him or her, do I really need that witness? Fourth, I want you to use the burden of proof. Fifth, I want you to use the Constitution. Sixth, I want you to make it personal. And seventh, I want you to never, never give up. So let's touch on those quickly. We, also, we already mentioned the lack of discovery. White collar lawyers have to do their own spade work. They have to dig it up themselves. Don't wait on discovery. It takes too much time. All it does is cause discovery disputes. And a savvy investigator is worth his or her weight in gold because a savvy investigator can create or not create at your option documents that are discoverable. The government, as we said, is always ahead. Criminal defense lawyers are always hustling to catch up. So analyze now. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Pay for the work now. Get the law analyzed. Get the witnesses locked down. Uh, get the sensitive documents uh, dealt with. Ask yourself, do you really need that witness? And this is a great failing of civil defense lawyers who think that if I put a hundred likable people on the stand, I'm going to win the case. In a criminal case, sin is distributed equally. Nobody is righteous in a criminal case. Every witness comes at a cost to his or her proponent. That's because, obviously, people with knowledge in a criminal case and who are competent witnesses have touched the offending behavior in some way. As much as possible, we want to tell our story through their people. And that, when done right, it's a wonderful thing because it puts our adversary in an impossible position. If we do it right, our adversary either has to accept those points that we like as true because they came from the mouth of his witness, or he has to impeach and attack his own witness. Either of those is a good outcome. As we all know, going back, remember, go back to law school. In a criminal case, the government has to prove each element of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt. Criminal defense lawyers harp on the burden in opening and in closing, and if you can do it, in the middle of trial. Civil lawyers don't harp on it enough. The preponderance of the evidence is still a hell of a lot of evidence. It's more likely than not. It's 51%. And it can be readily shown in wonderful demonstratives. I'm from the SEC. That would be the Southeastern Conference, not the Securities and Exchange Commission. And so I like to use football fields. And where does the government start? Way down at that goal line down there. And where do they got to get to? Not just to that goal line down there. They got to get into the end zone. Use the burden of proof because it's theirs. It's not ours. Use it against them for our benefit. Use the Constitution. In February, I was in a multi-defendant federal criminal trial that took most of the month. In opening, the lawyer for one of our co-defendants pulled out a tiny pocket Constitution. And I prepared myself morally and spiritually for an immense amount of cheesiness. <laughs> I was dead wrong. It was powerful the way that man talked about the Constitution and what it meant for everybody, judge, 
jurors, lawyers, defendants in that room. Civil defendants should use the Constitution too. We're not afraid of the jury. The jury protects us. It's given to us by the Constitution. Due process protects us from them. The burden of proof, which is constitutionally driven, protects us from them. Let's not be afraid of using it. Don't be afraid of pulling out a pocket Constitution. This is what Steve quoted at the beginning. It's on my web page. Novelist Scott Fitzgerald in his notebooks wrote to himself, draw your chair up to the edge of the precipice and I'll tell you a story. Criminal cases are deeply personal. Liberty is at stake. Uh, reputation is being uh, destroyed. Uh, savings are depleted. Marriages are under stress. That is what Fitzgerald was getting, about, getting at. Lots of lawyers can tell you a good story. The trick is to get judge and jury to pull their chair right up to the edge of the cliff so it's as personal for them as it is for you. Civil parties have to be humanized and civil lawyers have to believe as much as any criminal lawyer believes. Carl von Clausewitz, the uh, uh, military thinker and historian, uh, gets overquoted. But Clausewitz was right about this. Clausewitz, with regard to military strategy, said, pursue one great decisive aim with force and determination. Criminal defense lawyers have one great decisive aim, which is your client's liberty. They use force, they use determination because that's the only thing that can resist the overwhelming power of the state. And the defense of civil cases should be no different. Thank you.